Starting in the late 19th century, international Morse code became the backbone of long distance communications around the globe. Perhaps the most famous Morse code message was the distress call sent by the floundering Titanic in 1912. Come at once, we have struck an iceberg and we are sinking. By the time of World War II, Morse code was well established as the primary mode for long distance communications at sea. When America entered the war after Pearl Harbor, young men from across the country heard the call and volunteered for all the services, including the Merchant Marines. I think uh, I was at home listening to the radio. This was pre-television days. And they broke in with uh, an announcement that we had been attacked. And I was in high school at the time, and I thought, boy, I've got to get into this. And so I did. The United States mobilized its manufacturing resources to provide ships for supplying war materials to our allies, Great Britain and the Soviet Union. These Liberty ships and Victory ships were manned by merchant seamen and a naval armed guard, and they carried all types of war supplies throughout the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. I've always been interested, for some reason, in radio. And I was in Boy Scouts, and one of the scoutmasters was a ham radio operator. And he showed me his station one day and sent some Morse code. And that just fascinated me, and I knew I, I just have to do that. So, and that's what I wanted, and there was a radio program on uh, urging uh, volunteers for the Merchant Marine, and they needed radio operators, and I thought that's for me. As a Boy Scout, I had been introduced to it, but uh, I had no idea that I'd make a career out of it. Uh, Morse code, as far as I'm concerned, is my second language. Uh, during the war and, and in peacetime, when, when we were working uh, foreign stations or foreign ships, well, there was, it was not only the Morse code that they had to understand, but th there was a, a system of cue signals uh, that were international. Uh, a radio operator, a radio officer on ship and uh, ashore could pass traffic, whether he was a Chinese operator or a Russian radio operator or an American or what. Because when I would hear uh, QTC, that would mean to me, I have a message for you. Well, it would mean the same thing in Spanish or uh, Italian or, or whatever, uh, Russian or Chinese, to that person. So the Q code, there were enough of the uh, Q signs that you could easily carry on communications and uh, therefore it was, it was definitely a language. There were over 3,200 Liberty and Victory ships that carried the freight for the Allies during World War II but almost all have vanished from the American scene. Five have survived as museum ships, including the American Victory, birthed in downtown Tampa, Florida. Oh, the American Victory is, uh, that's, that's what I do to uh, remind me of what I used to do. <laughs> the American Victory is uh, uh, a wartime uh, victory ship built in 19, 44, I believe, and uh, she's been uh, been refurbished and uh, brought to Tampa as a, uh, a museum ship and has taken many uh, short voyages out to uh, to Egmont Key and uh, and 
and to the bridge uh, on or under her own steam and uh, uh, several of us on the in the radio department have uh, uh, refurbished the equipment we use the same uh, equipment that we did uh, back when the ship was operating that's all been refurbished mostly by Jim Howell and Tommy Beard once a week on Saturday mornings why or Saturday afternoons why uh, several of the uh, licensed radio officers that are in the area uh, go down there and, and actually fire off, fire up the equipment and make contact with the station on the west coast near San Francisco that is uh, using the call sign KSM now, but actually was KPH way back in, uh, in active days and one of the leading stations in the world. So the, this bunch of people out there have done on a larger scale what we've done here and uh, yeah, make, it, make it worthwhile to go down there and, and actually fire up the stuff and use the old Morse code there and, uh, and make contact using our license because they still require a radio operator with, a, with at least a second class radio telegraph license. Uh, to operate in those commercial bands. Uh, you can, we also have a ham station down there that's W4AVM that uh, really uh, does a, has, has a fine looking station. We have been given a room there on board the ship just on the same deck with the ship's radio room that uh, they've, uh, the, the group of, of hams have uh, set up a great uh, uh, a, a real radio, a ham radio station there that's uh, that's active. So, so American Victory is a, they they do have daytime tours. People can come down and uh, and walk aboard, and it's a self-guided tour. They're able to go from one end of the vessel to the other and see how it really was back then. But most of a seaman's time was spent on the daily routines aboard ship. Uh, the main thing was to stand a watch. And as you know, on most ships, the watch is four hours on, eight hours off. Uh, however, the radio officers stood uh, different kinds of hours. The first ship I was on were just two of us, and so we stood uh, split schedules so as to copy what was known as BAMs, broadcast to Allied merchant ships, which uh, was sent by Navy Radio Washington. NSS until you were halfway across the Atlantic and then you switched to Rugby Radio GBS in Rugby England and you had to make sure you copied all of the BAMS things because sailing orders and diversions and things like that were included uh, in the messages. Uh, and we listened on 500 kilohertz, we called them kilocycles back then, 500 kilohertz, which was the international calling and distress frequency. During the wartime, uh, you usually had three operators on board, so you would stand a, a four hour on, eight hour off watch, uh, and your first responsibility was to be sure that you did not miss a message. Uh, and you, because we operated under radio silence, and the only way that you could receive your message was to copy all these traffic lists from the Navy stations. And uh, if your ship came up on the on his traffic list, then you had better be be ready to copy that message. They would they would send it during two uh, two different schedules, probably four hours apart. But you had to get that, and it would usually come over in ciphers, groups of of uh, five numbers, uh, which we had learned how to decipher. We left Baltimore, and when we got out in the ocean, we were maybe surrounded by, say, six ships. And as we sailed north and east, ships came out of New York, then out of Boston, and then out of somewhere in Canada. And one morning, you wake up, and as far as you can see, there are ships. And it's quite a sight. And the ships are all in lines or rows. And each one has a number. Each row has a, 
uh, a letter, if I remember correctly, in each ship a number, and you maintain those positions in the convoy. Uh, way out ahead of the convoy, which uh, we never did see, were Navy ships uh, searching well, for something. one SOS. Um, it was in the Baltic Sea. Um, we were on the way back uh, from Poland uh, after a voyage over there immediately after the war. And so, therefore, it was officially an SOS and not a SSSS like we had during the war. But the ship had, uh, had hit something on the ground coming across. The, the area was full of sunken ships and everything. And so we thought that the, the uh, ship, her whole bottom was ripped out, of course. But the captain came running in and, Sparks, Sparks, here's the position. It's in an SOS. Okay, <laughs> no further explanation. So I did that, and uh, uh, pretty soon it appeared that we were not sinking, and uh, so we uh, we made it on into uh, the Keel Canal there on on the way back, and uh, and evidently we had just scraped over a, a sunken ship or something. The place was the area was full of mines anyway, and everybody was still nervous. But uh, that was the, uh, the only SOS I ever sent. Uh, during the war, there were, I, I heard several of the, in the Atlantic, the uh, SSS, uh, 4S messages. The, the range was, was pretty long on 500 kilocycles there, especially at night. And uh, you, could, you could hear it for 1,000 miles. Many of these new radio officers were assigned to Liberty ships, carrying war materials to Europe. Oh, my first ship, that was, that was a classic Liberty ship. Uh, quite an adventure. Went on board the ship in New Orleans and uh, found her to be fully loaded uh, with uh, war supplies for Italy. Well, we didn't know where we were going, but fully supplied. And we looked around a little bit and thought it was rather strange cargo because uh, the cargo holds were all completely filled with, with one cargo, bottled beer. When, the, when I graduated from high school at uh, 16 and a half, I was too young to get in any of the services. So I, most of us felt at that time that you had to get out there and where the action was. So I heard that they were uh, hiring men at 16 and a half in what they called the Merchant Marine or Maritime Service. I had no idea what it was. So I got in, I, I went through a boot camp, similar to Navy boot camp over at uh, St. Petersburg. And then after completion of that, for some reason, I don't know why they gave me an aptitude test for Morse code. And I must have passed because four of us each week were sent from St. Petersburg up to Hoffman Island uh, uh, radio uh, training station. And uh, that's where the Morse code really began. I had it beat by already being able to type. Uh, I could concentrate more on the Morse code. And that, that consisted of a room full of, of keys like this all in a line and somebody behind each one and the instructor up in front of you would he would send the code and you were expected to copy it and you could then he would it seems to me like we had a call sign or a station each of us and then he could call with morse code that your station and you better be able to answer that question but this as, as you got into it oh it must have been five hours a day of code practice. And uh, it, I saw several of the kids, and they were kids, just rip off their headphones and jam their pencil down into the desk and walk out. 
never to return. So it, it was it was tough, but that was my introduction to Morse code. WLO over in Mobile, Alabama. That's, uh, he's open right now for Cytor, which is the ship's uh, digital, ship digital type stuff. This is uh, what's called the reserve transmitter. It's on MF, 500 kilohertz, uh -huh. 600 meters. Wow, yeah. So uh, it, it uh, about three amps out. On 600 meters. That's great. You go down here, this is a auto alarm system. And this is uh, where the, the radio officer could hit one button and it's put out the SOS and stuff. Mm. And the, the uh, safety signals. And then you got a reserve receiver and a main receiver. So there's two receivers. Over here is the MF, that's the main transmitter, that's the biggie. That, it's got a pair of uh, 813s and it runs uh, about 600 watts on 500 kilohertz. Wow. And it's crystal controlled. Yeah. And, uh, let's see here. And it's got, 
nine, nine frequencies. There's basically nine frequencies mm -hmm. in the MF band that you can operate. And then this is the HF transmitter, and it's a pair of 813s in it also. And it runs about 600 watts. And right now it's on 12 megs, which is... The chief operator was on board uh, Sunday or Saturday, and, and this is a frequency synthesizer where we dial in the transmitter mm -hmm. frequency. So 12552 is uh, where he was working. Well, the chief operator is on board Saturday, June 16th. Work, work the shore station, KFS, in San Francisco on 12 megs. Here's the week before where I was on board. Oh, yeah. I work KFS, I send four pieces of traffic and receive one from them. So. Excellent, yeah. That's There's great. where I tested the 500s, the yeah. main and the reserve. And, uh, right. And the week before that there I was again, I was on board. Yeah. And I was just on 600 meters that time. No, I was. I I, get, I did got on 12 too and sent two messages and received two. So that yeah. shore station has stuff. So you better be ready to copy it if you say I'm ready to copy. Yeah, well, that's right. <laughs> so this is a typical mill. It's all caps, right? Well, yeah, it's yeah. all cop, caps. That's great. Don't see them around much either. And that's the ship's uh, radio license. Yeah. So we got, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven commercial licenses, the telegraph operators. However, there's only three of us that ever operate at all. I can talk to the bridge or the captain or the gyro room. Or As an intercom. Yeah. How do you signal them that you're going to speak? Or are they can they? Uh, hit typically, what you do is. Oh, I see. Like that. <laughs> and it's amazing. Uh, yeah. On the other end, it comes out pretty loud. That's about 600 watts on 12 megs. On 12 megs, yeah. 